Can you hear me? I can. I do. Yes. Excellent. Chris, do you Hello, need Tony. me to make you a co-convener so that you can put your slides up and share them? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, let me do that. Good luck, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, Tony. This is Steve. Hey, Steve. Thank you, Dr. Mudrick. Yeah, good to be here. Oh, St uh, Steve, Steve Anderson. Sorry, Chris. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, Steve, 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 Steve both Mudrick's Steves on, were talking. On board as well. <laughs> yeah, both <laughs> Steves were talking. <laughs> gotcha. Steve, right. Steve was a popular name a few years ago, right? <laughs> Apparently so. Well, thank you both for being here. Okay. Yeah, there might be a learning curve to this for me, so bear with me. Yeah, if you're a co-convener, you should be able to share the... Uh, okay. And I'm, I'm not how, sure how Jordan did it. He did it without me. What's the question? It. Is Jordan there? I'm here. What's the question? How did you share the screen without me giving you co-convener? Uh, all you need to do is, well, this would be done from Chris's laptop. He would just have to go to the bottom of his screen, click share, and then he should have control of the screen on his end. And uh -huh. see my screen now? Yeah. I'm seeing it. Okay. Does Is it saying quantifying evaporation in the atmosphere? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. That's where we're yeah, at. We're see yeah, we're seeing it, Chris. All right, good. I figured it out. Oh, I can admit people too. Look Producer. at that. Oh, you can. Yes. <laughs> oh, Neil Fox. Oh, he showed up. <laughs> is is Neil, is Chris's introducer here? Who yeah, is that's doing? me. Oh, that's Paula. Okay. Yep. All right, uh, let's see, we've got, we well, got a full house today. And even Dr. Mark, excellent. Full well, house situation's even better when internet works for everyone too. Yeah. Okay, well, it is four o'clock, and uh, and so I'll get things started here uh, with the class. Uh, first off, I want to uh, thank everyone for coming today. Uh, we have quite a few atmospheric science undergrads here today. Glad to see that as well. And um, for those of you in the class, make just make sure that you get the evaluations to me. You know, sometime this week, I'm not going to adhere to the 48-hour limit um, that uh, that's in the syllabus. Uh, but it would be nice to get them by 
by the uh, by the end of the weekend. So uh, that's just what's going on with the class. And for those of you in the class also, you'll notice that after today, there's only Mondays left. So uh, we're really getting down after this week toward the end of the semester. Um, anything else, uh, Dr. Anderson, do you get, have anything else to add? Uh, no, just again, reminder that next Wednesday, um, Pronk has been very kind and moving twice now. So she's now on uh, April 20th, that Monday, rather than April 8th. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Yep. Yep. No trouble. And um, okay. So Paula, the, I'm going to give the floor back uh, over to you. Okay. Thank you. So just to start off with some background about Chris, he is originally from a small town in Missouri named Tightwad. Um, he originally went to Mizzou back in 2007 as a biochemistry major, but decided that wasn't the right major for him. So he decided to pursue a military career. He joined the Air Force in 2010, and that's where he started his career in the military, or in meteorology, sorry. Um, he was stationed at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, where he forecasted for a military operations for the entire Northeastern United States. Um, and he spent some time at different stations, including Whiteman, but Scott Air Force Base is his regular base. Um, he got his associates in weather technology from the Community College of the Air Force in 2013, and then went back to Mizzou to get his bachelor's in soil, environmental, and atmospheric sciences in 2018 and he hopes to graduate with his Master's of Atmospheric Science in May. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Chris. Thanks a lot, Paula. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming in. Um, if my, my internet's a little shoddy sometimes, so if, uh, if I end up coming out or going out, just uh, I'm going to keep chugging, and uh, if anybody needs me to go back to any slides, uh, wait till the end of the presentation, and I can go back. Um, but uh, yeah, especially in the afternoon, the internet gets a little, a little dicey around here. So, um, so I'm Chris Stewart. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, quantifying evaporation in the lower atmosphere. So using um, linear regression computer modeling to assess the uh, drop size distribution and the evaporation quantification. And so let's see if this works. There we go. All right, did it change? Okay. Yes. So the more appropriate title for this is uh, How to Count Raindrops, a guide to all the things rain that you probably haven't thought about and never cared to know. So I'm painfully aware that this might be super irrelevant to most of you, but I'm here to tell you why you should care. And if nothing else, uh, you'll learn something about rain. Um, briefly touch on the rain formation and, eva and evaporation process. We will look at the evaporation model and the unknowns in that model. I'll teach you how to count raindrops and how to predict the number of drops and the change in the size of those raindrops. And then we'll put it all together in a case study to see if we are on target or if we have some more work to do. So the general purpose of this research is to improve rain forecasts. And the big questions in forecasting is, uh, are, or when is what gonna happen where? So when will it start raining or the onset timing? Uh, better better uh, quantitative precipitation forecasts, so that being what is the amount of rain that will fall from the sky, which has implications for flooding forecasts. And where can we expect cold pooling and downdrafts due to evaporative cooling? Uh, this amounts to better predictions for damaging winds and also thunderstorm development. Uh, this will even answer some of the more important questions like, should I bring an umbrella to work? And do I need to water the garden today? So pretty crucial stuff for you guys. Um, so why does it rain? Uh, I stole this picture from NOAA. It's the water cycle that you may have learned in grade school or primary school, whatever side of the pond you grew up on. And then uh, the rain occurs when lift from a lifting mechanism like a front or upward motion due to surface heating lifts and cools a parcel of air. Water vapor in the lifted air then condenses onto a cloud condensing nuclei as the air cools to saturation. Uh, this could be a uh, microscopic dust particle of salt, uh, 
um, or a sub, you know, sub-Saharan dust particle, shout out to my boy j -Rab. And so when a sufficient amount of condensation builds up, uh, you get clouds. And when water begins to fall from the cloud, as the lift no longer supports the water density, uh, you have precipitation. So this brings us to evaporation. Evaporation happens when rain falls from a saturated environment of the cloud into the dry air below it. Uh, there's also always uh, at least a little bit of evaporation going on every time it rains. The actual amount of water that hits the ground depends on a few different factors. One of those factors is the drop size distribution. A majority of the drop size distribution immediately below the cloud base consists of smaller drops but the proportion of the drop sizes can vary wildly depending on the weather or whether or not you have uh, convective or non-convective rain. Smaller drops evaporate faster than larger drops. So knowing how many of what size drops are in the air will determine how much evaporation is actually occurring. And then also the relative humidity. Uh, I have it here as RH. The uh, drier the environment, the faster the evaporation. And then resonance time. So how long the drop spins in the atmosphere. So that's a function of how high the cloud base is and also the magnitude of the vertical motions, which we'll get into a lot uh, here in a second. <clears throat> um, and then there's the feedback. So each one of these parameters, the resonance time, relative humidity, and the drop size distribution, uh, uh, drop size distribution um, affects one another. So as a drop evaporates, that increases the relative humidity of the environment below the cloud base, which decreases the rate of evaporation. Also, evaporative cooling will cause downward sinking air, and uh, that'll decrease the resonance time. So a lot of considerations making it difficult to quantify. So this uh, microscale process is often missed by our forecast models and, uh, and radar rain estimations. So now the dry stuff, modeling evaporation, Un totally intended. Uh, quantifications of evaporation is done drop by drop. So the change of the drop diameter over time will tell us how much liquid water content is being evaporated. So this change is dependent on the environmental vapor pressure or E infinity, and then relative to the vapor pressure of the drop or E to the radius of the drop. If the environmental vapor pressure is less than the drop, the radius of the drop will decrease over time. Evaporation, yay. If the environmental vapor pressure is greater than the drop, the radius of the drop will increase with time. So that's not what we want for evaporation. Whoops. So um, the goal is to find the diameter change for each drop given certain atmospheric conditions over an entire drop size distribution through an entire dry layer to the surface. So uh, in Roger and Yao 1989 modeled, this is what will be the model that we're using for our quantification. And um, I didn't go through all the terms. Uh, when I ran through my presentation earlier, I was uh, woefully over a reasonable time. So we will uh, we'll come back to this if, uh, if need be, if anybody has any burning questions. Um, so let's lay out our unknowns for this model. So the drop size distribution for one, it's um, how do we best model the dr distribution of drop sizes as they evolve? There is one distribution that is widely used, uh, but in my research, I aim to improve that model. And also I discover a new method using linear regression computer modeling. Um, the vertical motion, can we observe real-time atmospheric vertical motions to include in the model? And does our forecast modeled vertical motions represent that? <clears throat> and then the environment, do our forecast models serve us as well as the real environmental profile with all these parameters? And so dot, 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 what other information might we need to research to get to an accurate quantification? And then uh, the granddaddy unknown is evaporation. Have we done it? Did it? How did our model do? Uh, how can we tell? And we will look at one of the case studies we did. Uh, but before we can uh, make predictions, we need to make measurements. So we have a, a few tools at our disposal here. We have an OT laser distrometer. So uh, that measures our drop size distribution from the surface and was pretty instrumental in the linear regression model development. Uh, we have the micro rain radar, and that's how we observe the evolution from the cloud base. 
and then the balloons. That gives us a real-time environment that we can run our evaporation model through. <clears throat> How am I coming through? Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right, so here's a, some of the specs that, are, that come with the uh, laser astronomer and the microwave and radar. I won't read through these uh, just in the interest of time, but we can come to back, uh, back to this if anybody has any questions about it. But we're gonna get into how these instruments actually work. So uh, how to count raindrops with lasers. So let's take a look at how these instruments actually count them. Laser distrometer uses the amount of laser light blocked as a relationship to the diameter of the drop as it falls through the laser diode. It also measures the velocity of that drop or how fast it passes through the laser. A uh, fall velocity uh, drop diameter relationship can be established and the larger the diameter, the faster the drop will fall. Um, so by quantifying and plotting this relationship, we can get real drop size distributions, um, which we can then use to model. Uh, we have several uh, quantities plotted and compared here. So we have uh, from Gunn and Kinzer 1949, Atlas Ulbricht uh, seven, or 1976, Farrow 2001, and then there is Steward 2020. One of these things is not like the other. Uh, so what was that guy thinking? So I, I just want to point out that this is the importance of kind of putting your work uh, up next to previous works. Um, just to see if, uh, if everything matches up, because um, clearly it wasn't. I was using this for a, for a while in my, in my uh, calculations, and I was coming up with wild numbers. So uh, shout out to Professor Fran Soren in Denmark for catching my crucial mistake. Uh, but once again, it's, it's worth putting your work up next to other people's to see how you did. Um, so this is a laser distrometer observation of real drop size distribution. Um, so this is the, uh, the Gunn and Kinzer curve. Any, anything observed above that curve is falling too fast to be liquid rain or is being forced in some way. Uh, below the curve, uh, it, it's falling too slow to be liquid rain. So anything along this curve, the green curve, shown, if I can get my mouse over there, shown here, will be real-time rain that we can use in our uh, uh, modeling. <clears throat> And so here we have a snow case. So you can kind of see along um, the x-axis here, there's, there's little uh, distributions um, kind of extending out toward the uh, diameter. That would be the snow as it falls slower, kind of below that one meter a second. Anything above that is going to be uh, mist, and that could be because of the uh, wind, the wind shear kind of blowing that faster than, than the fall velocity would say it would. So this is a, an example of snow and mist. Now the micro rain radar. So this uh, uh, transmits electromagnetic uh, radiation, uh, radiation vertically. Uh, the radiation hits something in the atmosphere and is scattered back to the receiver. So this could be hydrometers, lithometers, meteors, anteaters, whatever's in the sky it's going to reflect off of. So the MR software calculates the power and phase shift to determine the drop size and velocity of the following drop. Uh, also going, uh, I'm also going to pass the math uh, behind it, uh, but we can come back to it if anybody has any questions about it. Um, so we're going to move on. So one of the things that you can uh, have happen with this is attenuation, and this occurs when uh, the size or the concentration sufficiently blocks out further propagation of the radar beam. So it's like trying to see a house behind a single tree versus trying to see a house through a forest. If your eyes were the radar, the trees were the rain, and the house was floating about 6.2 kilometers in the sky. Um, so then if we can apply some attenuation correction to this, and this, uh, this will allow us to make better uh, calculations, but it's important to, real, to know when this is happening uh, in case we have any error in our calculations. Uh, fall velocity, and this can give us a lot of information about the rainfall environment. So recognizing the melting layer is important. Uh, this is where ice crystals turn into water droplets shown by the increase in fall velocities below the red line. So everything in the green is gonna be falling faster than everything in the blue if you look on the scale uh, down here. And this is in meters per second. Um, it's also important to recognize updrafts and downdrafts uh, because fall velocities play a big part in the evaporation calculation. Uh, strong updrafts and downdrafts can skew our calculations. 
So uh, here's an example of fall velocities. If uh, anyone can chime in to guess what this is. Any hint? Is that one there? Bueller? It's snow. All right. I think we may have lost Chris, so uh, be patient as a co -con as a co convener. He can uh, just re log back into this meeting. He should be able to. So. I'll email him just to make sure he knows. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully he got the message. All right, well, hopefully he uh, finds us again. We are experiencing technical difficulties. We hope to have the signal back momentarily. I've, I've emailed him with two emails, so hopefully he's <laughs> paying attention to that. Anybody got his cell phone? Could call him? Yeah, I can shoot him a text if you want at least. Yeah. I texted him already, if anyone can hear me. Who was that? Neil. No, I think I think that was Neil. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks, Neil. I complained that I have to look at your face while he's not here, so you know, hopefully that'll encourage him to get back on. There. <laughs> yeah, that's much better. <laughs> yeah. That's why I am unfaced. And me too. I suspect that running that animation probably killed his um, connection. We'll, we'll put it on the cat. That's probably a little better. Well, I, I don't know what internet he has, but I know that uh, 
Century Tell was having a few issues yesterday. So. Brendan, did he say he's having a lot of trouble getting back? I have not received anything back. Okay. I connect. I'm at my parents' house now, though, and the cell service here is god awful. So it might have honestly just not sent yet. Oh. Neil is a. Uh... You got good service, right? Well, I yeah. I, he hasn't replied to the texts that I sent. So. I just sent him a text as well from my end. I haven't received anything back yet. Yeah, hopefully he's not just going on as if nothing happened. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's if it's uh, if he can't be in here, he's not recording either. So actually, let me stop. The okay, there you are. Hello. Hello, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Welcome back. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> Who do you, you have? Plug do you have Century? Plug it back in. The extension? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, CenturyLink. It doesn't work very well. That's what I have, and that was working very poorly yesterday. It's. I think there's just so many people on in the afternoons, especially. Um, it. Uh, if you can uh, enable me to share, I'll just. I'll try to pick up, pick up where I left off and just kind of power, power through as fast as I can. Okay. Let me find you. And thanks everybody for hanging around. I really appreciate that. Okay. And you are the co-host again. Okay. So let's do screen two. Where did it cut out? Neil, do you remember? <laughs> oh, you were talking about snowflakes. Yeah, you just oh, run yeah. your Nightmare Before Christmas animation, which is probably what killed it. Oh, this it. one? <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably what killed it. Okay, can you see my, can you see my screen now? Yeah, yes. that's, that's the last thing we saw. Right. Okay, all right. Okay, so unfortunately, my phone is hooked up to the internet too because I don't have self service either. So <laughs> I'm getting a flood of messages right now from people. Uh. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's go back to the beginning. Or not the beginning, but where I left off. Oh, too fast, too fast. Okay, so snow, that's snow. Um, and. So moving on, um, so where we're we at so far, we're, we observed the rain's drop size distribution below the cloud base with the micro rain radar. We then model the evolution of the distribution as it rains into the dry layer. And then we see if our final distribution matches what we observe at the surface with the laser distrometer. And this chart shows the uh, drop size distribution at the cloud base observed by the micro rain radar compared to the drop size distribution observed by the surface. Um, 
And so, uh, making it rain. So now we have collected our data. We try to model the drop size distribution. Uh, gamut is the traditional method developed originally by Marshall Palmer with filter paper, flower pans, and good old pen and paper. Um, we'll pass the math derivations for now, but if we can come back, um, if anybody has any burning questions, um, then we can uh, talk about how these things are derived. But uh, Bongard and Fox 2019 used the method of moments, uh, which is a mathematical derivation to attempt to solve for uh, a fitting mu and lambda scale uh, shape parameters of the gamma distribution. Uh, what Fox uh, Steward 2020 uh, looks to use is laser distrometers and machine learning techniques in the drop distribution modeling. Now, I'm not trying to flex on Marshall Palmer's methods of filter paper and flower pans, but I'm definitely flexing on Marshall Palmer's methods of filter papers and flower pans. So moving on, uh, using the linear regression toolkit and the gamma function to find the mu and lambda in our data coding program MATLAB, we can create a best fit line for a gamma distribution. Uh, using the GAMFIT function, we can pass the drop distributions observed by the laser distrometer through the linear regression model to get a decent representation of the drop size distribution. But wait, there's more. We can also get instantaneous uh, fit accuracy with that. So we can see how our model is doing with these fit statistics, uh, such as R, R squared, which uh, um, a good fit would be a one, would be a perfect fit for this. So the gamma is doing really well. Uh, we'll admit her. Um, got, so this got me thinking, what other functions work with rain distributions? And next. Ah, oh, there we go. Ah, too far, too far. Oh, that's far. Okay. Uh, so this is where I discovered the Gaussian distribution. Um, once again, I'm going to skip the derivation of this, but uh, a, a, a Gaussian or a normal distribution gives equal weight to both sides of the peak. So given uh, that most rain scenarios have higher concentration of smaller drops and then trails off with a longer tail of larger drops, uh, this really is a poor representation. But I can use a triple Gaussian. So what a triple Gaussian does is it adds multiple iterations of the Gaussian distribution and attempts to fit the data using the least of squares linear regression algorithm and that the, model, uh, the computer model provides. Uh, this resolves the issue of the long tail represented by the smaller concentrations of the larger drops. But why not go crazy and just use two, four, five, a hundred iterations? So first of all, a hundred iterations would be a nightmare to code and the equation wouldn't fit in a thesis. But, uh, so I, I looked at this, I attempted to graph uh, multiple iterations of the Gaussian and for the most part, the Gauss four seemed to be beat the other models. Uh, so it looks to be the best choice, right? Well, actually it turns out that more iterations of the Gaussian increases the chance of model overcompensation uh, for the distribution and it blows up. So this happens when there are not enough curves in the data for the model to resolve based on the number of iterations. So this can still happen in any of the machine driven algorithms, but a Gauss three limits the, the occurrences of this while still getting the best fit distribution. So again, that's the Gauss three limits the risk of blow up and maximizes the reward of a good curve fit. So don't worry, there's nothing to say. Thank you. So how does the new Gauss three linear regression model compare to the gamma distribution model? Well, way better in this one scenario. Uh, the Gauss three has beaten the gamma in all fit at, with the fit statistics in this one scenario. Uh, the Gauss three destroys the gamma uh, 1.2 to uh, 9.2 respectively for the, um, <clears throat> for the uh, RMSE. And uh, so, you know, we can look more into these later, but I want to go on because not just looking at the fit, just looking at the fit statistics can be misleading. It's a, it doesn't necessarily translate to better calculations. So even though the model curve may fit better in most of the areas, uh, we should make some meaningful calculations based on the distribution models and compare them to real data. 
um, in integrating under the curve to solve the kinetic energy uh, rain rate, the reflectivity, and the liquid water content will give us something more tangible to work with. So this is where skills and coding can really help a guy or gal out because that is a whole lot of complicated integrations to do by hand. But who knows, maybe Dr. Lupo uh, may be up for the challenge. <laughs> so comparing the results of the reflectivity, uh -oh. kinetic energy, rain rate, and liquid water content to the gamma and the Gauss-3, uh, the, the raw calculations of the, in the laser distrometer output, uh, the reflectivity in the Gauss-3 beats the gamma, the kinetic energy in the Gauss-3 beats the gamma, the rain rate is a toss-up uh, between the two, and the liquid water content is a virtual tie. So overall, the winner is the Gauss-3. But however, any self-respecting scientist knows you need multiple data sets and statistical analysis to make any sort of sound scientific claim. And any self-respecting scientist knows this usually involves some sort of depressingly repetitive task that involves the analysis of hundreds of data sets. Well, that's just what I've done in the name of science. So what I did was I took 673 rain scenarios and found the fit statistics for each one of them over the last year. Um, I had a lot of instances where my uh, equipment didn't work because of the power outages at Bradford Farm. Uh, thankfully, it rained a lot last year, so <laughs> I got a lot of good data. Uh, so this consisted of two days of adjusting the time of interest and clicking play on my model over and over and over again. So um, as you can see, the Gauss-3 linear regression model beats out the gamma linear regression model in every single fit statistic category. However, like stated before, a better fit doesn't necessarily translate to better calculations. So I calculated each of the four parameters which amounted to about 8,100 integration calculations. So calculate that, Dr. Lupo. <laughs> uh, so uh, roughly, and so the results are roughly 2% of my model uh, runs resulted in blow up. Uh, the Gauss-3 model experienced this uh, 13 runs and the Gamma model two runs um, through those case. And so I threw those cases out uh, for both the models to maintain the st uh, statistical continuity to just to see how both models when they were running well, did well. And then, uh, so um, how I compared this was, um, I used both models to compare the observations made by the laser distrometer. And I will, will admit that I'm not sure how the laser distrometer uh, makes its estimations. So it, it will be ignored uh, primarily. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of literature out there uh, on how the laser distrometer makes those calculations, but I do use these raw calculations to compare. So, um, <clears throat> So I looked at the uh, also looked at the percentage at, um, of the of the percentage of calculations were under a certain different uh, threshold. So uh, to save you time uh, to read and interpret this mess of numbers, I'll tell you that the uh, reflectivity, uh, the gamma wins out overall. Um, but the Gaussian didn't do so bad in in, in most of these um, observations. The gamma just did better. Uh, for liquid water content, again, the gamma is the clear winner here. Uh, with the liquid water contact value. Um, so the, uh, the gamma model uh, had observations, all three um, differences staying above the 90 percentile. Uh, gamma didn't, uh, or the Gaussian didn't do bad, but the gamma did way better. Uh, this is a sloth loving up on a cat. It has nothing to do at all with rain, but it's undeniably adorable and undoubtedly has made your day a little better. So. Moving on. For the kinetic energy calculation, which by the way may have implications for soil erosion in future studies um, for you soil people, the gamma grabs the edge in the statistical comparison. Uh, it has a lower mean difference and a smaller standard deviation uh, difference for the raw calculations. And the Gauss 3 does have some smaller range difference. However, in percent of observations and mean differences, the gamma increasingly has the edge over the Gauss 3 for kinetic energy. And so the last one is, this is where the uh, Gauss-3 actually took the edge over the rain rate uh, with the rain rate calculations over the gamma model. Um, so uh, that being said, the, uh, the Gauss-3, uh, both models did well, uh, but overall the gamma had won, um, you know, most of these uh, parameter calculations. So more study needs to be needed, uh, needs to be conducted as to what works better situationally, but I guess there is something to be said for flower pans and pen and paper. So you win this round, Marshall Palmer, you win this round. 
So where are we now uh, with the unknowns? Uh, just, we're just getting warmed up. We've solved the drop size distribution, well, uh, theoretically. And so now we're gonna move on to the atmospheric vertical motions. In uh, John Bongard's uh, thesis last year, he showed that the vertical motions play a substantial role in the evaporation of computation. A, uh, dropped, uh, I dropped rain through two simulated uh, vertical motions with all else being equal in the evaporation model, and one with uh, no vertical motions on the bottom left, and one with a half a meter per second vertical motion on the right. And so the results of that were the half meter per second, all the drops under 1.5 millimeters in diameter were completely eliminated. Whereas compared to the um, zero vertical motion, all drops above 0.75 survived. So this would significantly change any evaporation quantification when considering thousands of drops are falling in a single minute. And so uh, there, the problem is there is no proven way to accurately measure vertical motions um, in the lower atmosphere. And this is clearly a vital part of the evaporation quantification. Uh, but there is a potential solution. Uh, in the case studies conducted, the radio sound data included ascension rates on the time scale of one per second in the data packet. So the theory developed by Evan Travis, the fine young gentleman on the left, is the ascent rate should remain relatively stable unless acted on by other forces. So what he did was a, a linear regression for every 200 layers representing the mean motion of the balloon's rise. So any perturbations from the mean would be induced from outside forces. So those balloon, so the balloon derived vertical motions could be included in the evaporation model. Um, so here's kind of some of the data that Evan had sent to me. And so the results are very promising, um, but how do we know this is truly what, what's happening? So what we, what we would expect to find is with upward motion, you cool adiabatically and the relative humidity would uh, with downward motion, you warm adiabatically and the relative humidity would decrease. So that is exactly what's happening on this one case uh, on October 5th. So the physics makes sense and lines up pretty well with the theory. So this will help us um, accurately test the ev evaporation model, but we can't just go and do balloons every time it rains. So the question becomes, do the forecast models represent this as well? And the short answer is not really. Uh, the red line is the vertical, uh, the model vertical motion, and the blue line is the balloon vertical motion. So the model gives us vertical motions and pressure coordinates, which is then I converted to the Cartesian coordinates. And then the results are orders of magnitude off. So this could be due to the coarse spatial resolution of a, a NAM 12K, a 12 kilometer model uh, used in this scenario, and the temporal resolution of one hour. So this resolution would not account for the microscale processes that are at play. But if we magnify this, does it match the, the balloon motion? Well, no, not really. So multiplying the model shows that the trends are not that well represented. Uh, solutions to this could be to use vertical motions from a higher resolution model, uh, such as the 3K uh, HRRR and the 3K NAM nest. Um, or to derive vertical motions from adiabatic trends using the model output. But this has yet to be explored in just a kind of a baby thought at this point. So we'll have to talk about how to make this a reality. Okay, so where are we at? So we've got, uh, we've, uh, looking back at our unknowns, we're almost there. And so what's left, we have to characterize the environment. And how do we do that? We do that with weather balloons. The balloons allow us to run the evaporation model with real environmental data. So in Pol Polarity Fox 2018, they used only model-derived data to characterize the environment. And there is some question as to the accuracy of the characterized environment when you are trying to assess how the evaporation model is performing. A real-time environment would work best. Thus, John Bongard, the handsome gentleman in the video in Fox 2 2019, used real-time data to characterize the environment from the, those balloons. So what Stuart Fox 2020 aims to compare is the model environment evaporation rates to the real data also included in the newly derived uh, drop size distribution modeling. And so looking back at our unknowns, we have everything we need to solve evaporation, hopefully. 
And so this is how it works. We, uh, we get a team together, uh, we do some forecasting, we identify a rain day, we assess a dry layer and discuss the evaporation potential, uh, collect model sounding data from the NAM, the GFS and the RAP models. And then um, we get a team of graduates, undergraduates, Danish professors, and then uh, we work together to, uh, in the name of science. And so our first case study was done in October 5th, uh, 2019. And uh, it's important to be very sure about our forecast potentials because we have very limited resources. You know, helium ain't cheap. And so a big thanks goes out to Dr. Market for uh, keeping our operations afloat. Uh, so we did four balloons on this day. Uh, three of the balloons survived, one tragically met its end. Uh, so pour one out for balloon C. And uh, for a dollar amount of $400 a pop, these things are incredibly del delicate. So looking at the radar, this is a, a look at the St. Louis radar um, of the scenario. We had a few convective cells to our east, a few spotty showers passing over, and a line of stratiform uh, to our west. And so those spotty showers over uh, the top of us is what we're going to be mainly interested in. Uh, here's what the MRR observed over the time period. But I want to hone in on this little guy at uh, 3,500 meters, about uh, 1815 Zulu, um, at around 20 decibels. And this has clearly completely evaporated uh, before it reached the surface. So does our model match suit? Does our model completely evaporate this, um, ov th this over, the, uh, over that time scale? If Bloom C had survived, it would have been perfect timing because that was our 18Z launch. So we had to settle with Bloom B to characterize the environment in the evaporation model. Uh, Bloom B was set up about 1630 Zulu and the Bloom's vertical winds were used in the model. Uh, I set the EVAP model height at 4,400 meters as this was where the MR started to pick up the reflectivity. Uh, the model suggests that all the drops uh, below 1.75 millimeters evaporated. But uh, this is before we add the gamma and the Gaussian model distribution to the equation. So what is shown above are simulated, simulated drops that do not necessarily represent what is following, uh, falling from the cloud base. So when we add the model drop, drop size distributions, what happens? The green line in the uh, top uh, chart there is the liquid water content observed by the MR. We want to try to match that line as best as we can because that's how we know our model is working. And so um, the uh, blue line is the, the Gaussian drop size distribution liquid water content calculation. The yellow line is the gamma drop size distribution liquid water content. And the red line not seen is the method of moments used in the uh, Bongard Fox 2019, but does not show up in the scenario for whatever reason. Uh, the closer the model is to the green line, like I said, the better the model works. And so it's a big win for the Gauss 3 in this one case scenario. But uh, the Gaussian shows the liquid water content crash crashing to zero around the starting, uh, starting around 2,500 meters, uh, only a little below the real MRR observation where it shows it um, kind of crashing to zero and the re reflectivity disappearing in the, in the chart below from the MRR observation. So how does a forecast sound compare? Uh, we use a 12Z NAMNES 30 hour model. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have access to a lot of the, um, the um, because I'm here and, and they shut down campus, so I can't really gather uh, uh, some, some of the data that we have. So I've had to use whatever buff kit sounding stuff I have. Um, but for this particular model, uh, 30 hours out, it's, it's not a bad uh, forecast um, time. So this, uh, what this model does is it aggressively evaporates the, the drops uh, below that 4,400 meter drop. And so why does this happen? <clears throat> so here's the liquid water content equivalent. And that if we look at the relative humidity profile, we see that the three kilometer NAMNES model is much drier at the drop height. And so in that blue line, dash line kind of represents uh, the top one being the NAMNES sounding and the bottom one being Bloom B. So you can see that, yeah, the um, model is going to way over uh, estimate the amount of evaporation that's happening. And then, uh, so now let's look at the onset timing. We saw 
uh, the model does really well with the, with that. And so what about, how about as it's raining? So we look at 19Z or 1930 Zulu. <clears throat> and my connection is unstable again. So if I drop, I apologize. Um, here's the uh, relative humidity profile uh, for the observed sounding. And here's how the evaporated um, uh, evaporation work. Now this is uh, with zero vertical motion. So I took out the vertical motion just to kind of see how the how the drops uh, did. Um, because when I when I put in the vertical motion, all the drops kind of uh, crashed to the left. Um, so that didn't give us any really um, tangible information there. So then the um, <clears throat> so it shows the liquid water content, very, uh, you know, very little liquid water content reaching the surface. And, in, and then um, for our uh, models, uh, the Gauss actually, or actually the method of moments finally picked up, welcome to the show. And then the uh, Gauss and the gamma, um, uh, the Gauss over, or I mean, so the gamma overestimating and the Gauss uh, overestimating the amount of liquid water content. So what did the OT observe? Um, so the raw calculation shows uh, about 0 0.03 uh, in liquid water. So if we look at our back here, we're showing about 0.3 on the um, on the on the Gauss, and then um, the method of moments has about 0.8. So we want to try to match uh, this observation as close as we can. So it's, so it turns out we have some more work to do. Uh, so just in summary, the, uh, we, evaluate, we need to evaluate more case studies with the evaporation. Um, so on April 22nd is my thesis defense and uh, invite everybody to come attend that one and, and it'll be through Zoom, <clears throat> uh, presumably. And then we'll find a reliable quantity for the uh, model derived vertical motion with more study with the balloon ascension. We'll compare other high resolution models uh, with the environmental EVAP to real soundings, and then more experiments with linear regression modeling and drop size distributions. Uh, with that, a big thanks uh, to everyone for attending. Uh, thanks to my mom, Carrie, uh, for her support. Um, and then uh, John, Paula, Brendan, Evan, for all their help and the sanity checks and margaritas. Uh, Dr. Fox for putting up with all my questions. Dr. Lupo for his encouragement. Dr. Market for his expertise and his, uh, and his resources. And then uh, are there any preguntas? Okay, um, do we have any questions? Yes, I actually have one for you, Chris. First of sure. all, very, very interesting presentation, very well done, first of all. Um, my main question goes as follows. So when you're looking at, you know, trying to evaluate, obviously you really well explained the issue of drop size distribution and really assessing evaporation considerations. Mm -hmm. But as far as, you know, one of the things you mentioned in your talk and that I can attest to a little bit, is the three kilometer you know resolution going for a higher resolution and assessing how even an increased resol resolved modeled environment regardless of whether or not it's the wharf or the nam or any other modeled environment one of the biggest things is really trying to assess how is the model producing you know conversion zones right in the first place when you're dealing with whether or not a parcel is going to become more stable or unstable with time so i guess my question mm -hmm. is in your opinion do you think that increasing resolution is the only factor, or do you think there could be more of a microphysical consideration of how we're resolving, like the planetary boundary layer, or more specifically, the near surface convective layer? Well, I think you just answered your own question there. I mean, if so, like you said, it's a micro scale process. Uh, so the higher resolution that we have, the closer we can get to resolving some of those, uh, some of those features. Um, I think that uh, I, I, I think we should more explore um, how we can um, derive the uh, atmospheric vertical motions based on the, um, the, the maybe the relative humidity profile. So, like, I sh can there be a correlation in the uh, amount of like saturation that's going on in the environment with a? Uh, and this will take some more balloon soundings to, to um, balloon, balloon sounding research to see how the vertical motion compares to the evaporation rates. Uh, in the, or not the, the evaporation rates, but the relative humidity and the uh, atmospheric profile. So, I mean, obviously we're, we're working with these really uh, kind of, we're trying to resolve a micro scale feature with, uh, you know, macro scale models. And so it's hard to do that way. 
Um, but I think there is a there is a possibility that we can find some kind of relationship to help parameterize that. Yeah, and the second part, the second, I just have one other part of my question slash a comment to add to that comment, and it's completely validated. And there's a ton of vindication in that reality that you just pointed out. Um, the other thing I would just mention is the fact that when you're looking at, you know, how a model is resolving, whether or not a given layer is evaporating or condensing, more particles also has to do with, you know, what sorts of particles are you dealing with as well is something to just consider because the nature of evaporation in the first place, and this might go with all due respect beyond the scope of what you're trying to attack, but it's mm -hmm. something to consider that even goes beyond the scope of what I'm looking at myself is that, you know, different particle types have different behavior tendencies, right? Whether or not you're dealing mm -hmm. with more of like a sulfide or, you know, a, a phosphor sure. like yeah. particle of the atmosphere. So it's, it gets a little bit more complicated, but um, I think one of the neat things to try to do is to maybe isolate one species as mm -hmm. far as what you're looking at. So like mm -hmm. even in the event you talked about with the snow, right? That snow, um, I guess I, the profile, I can't remember exactly what it was, but you're pointing out after 1850Z during one mm -hmm. event, even in snow uh, research and snow air chemistry research, they look at what was the predominant in cloud species and how does that relate to like the presence of Virga or you know mm -hmm. precipitation, frozen or liquid, reaching or not reaching the surface? So just something to think about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. I have one. Um, sure. Can can Neil's radars calculate convergence or divergence? Um, I I think that there is some uh, some work into that that he's done um, as far as uh, convergence and divergence. That would be a better question for for him. Um, so my so the uh, the MRR doesn't directly do that, and I, I don't know if the um, if his uh, radar does that either. But uh, uh, that would be a question. Yeah, you could you could just use the kinematic method to right. get vertical motion. So. Yeah, no, that would absolutely, that would help. Um, and so that's another area that we can explore looking at vertical motions. Yeah, that's, that's another project that we're working on to match with that. So maybe that's Evan's project. I don't know. Uh, but, <laughs> He's got uh, so many right, projects. <laughs> but right, radar derived convergence and divergence. I've had a couple of students do thesis on. Um, it's extremely tricky but we're working on it and this is so this works both ways it's kind of can we use the balloon ascent to validate the convergence or can we use the convergence to validate the balloon measurements it, both of those have which came um, first the chicken or the egg yeah both both of them have uncertainties uh, and it's so which one you're using to validate the other becomes a, a question. Anyone else? Very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mudrick. Appreciate it. Well, hearing uh, no other questions, uh, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. And uh, Again, for those of you in the 